it's pretty much a consensus opinion across the nation that this is the best wide receiver core in the nation. And certainly they can haul in a few errant throws if they these quarterbacks aren't exactly on the money because the waves and waves of talent and speed and size and just giftedness is ridiculous, starting with Chris Olave. Yeah, it is. And you know, Chris Olave, obviously the most experienced of the wide receivers at Ohio State, coming off a career high 50 catches, only played seven games last year, missed one game with, with the COVID health, health and safety protocols, 729 yards, led the team with seven touchdowns. Uh, you know, a guy who wasn't super highly recruited, had to miss his junior year after transferring in high school. But uh, the Buckeyes found a, a talented player, and that became evident pretty early on in his career. And he's just gotten better and better. A surprise, really, that he came back. He was a guy who probably could have gone pretty high in the NFL draft. But he said during the spring he felt like he had unfinished business at Ohio State. Uh, the, the thought is he wants to be the number one receiver taken in, in the NFL draft. So come back for another year. Ohio State has gotten close with the national championship the last two years, including playing the title game last year. Uh, he, he wants to go out on top and, and now he'll have another chance to do that. Garrett Wilson right behind him. Those were the two primary receivers for Ohio state last year, a lot of two tight end sets. So two wide receivers on the field, uh, Wilson, 43 catches, 723 yards and six touchdowns, a, a great sophomore year for him, obviously as well. You know, those two guys, I, I broke it down for something I wrote earlier today. If you put them on a 12 game, uh, regular season pace, instead of the seven or eight games that they played, they're both over a thousand yards. And Ohio State's only had five receivers in history of the program reach that a thousand yard mark. So to have two that were on pace to do it last year is pretty remarkable. And then you dig into the the depth behind them. Not a ton of experience, but uh, a lot of talent. Julian Fleming was the number one receiver in the country in the 2020 class. Jackson Smith and Jigbo was right behind him. Um, G. Scott Jr. is a guy who, who did some stuff at tight end this spring and, and may end up staying at that position. So he's kind of a guy we can touch on at both spots. But all of those, all three of those guys should be able to make a bigger impact than they did as, a fre as freshmen. You know, they just didn't have the offseason and things to, to kind of get completely comfortable jumping from that high school offense to college offenses. And I think that's why the coaches didn't put them in a game a ton. And then you've got the freshmen that are coming in who will have a more normal offense. Uh, starts with Ignacio Ibuka, the number one receiver in his class. Um, so that's back-to-back -back number one receivers with Julian Fleming um, for Ohio State. Marvin Harrison Jr., the son of Hall of Famer Marvin Harrison, who looks more the part than than his dad did. He's uh, you know six three, six four, and and you know he's been out at, out at some of those Ohio State camps. Looks like an NFL wide receiver build wise already. Um, and then Jaden Ballard is is kind of I don't want to say the forgotten guy at wide receiver in that class, but you know, the, when, you, when you're coming into a class with so much talent, he hasn't been talked about as much. But a guy who certainly, I believe, will make an impact, maybe not as a freshman at Ohio State, but a top 15 receiver in the country in his class. So, you know, that's what, eight, nine guys right there that, uh, that I listed. It's, um, as you said, widely considered to be the top receiving core in the country. Now, these guys have to go out and prove it. Other than Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, not a lot of experience, as I said. So, you know, they, they've got to go do it for a young quarterback. So, um, you know, you know what you've got with Garrett Wilson. You know what you've got with Chris Olave. These other guys are very talented, but have to go out and make plays. And I believe that they will. And just to extend on your thousand yard uh, receiver narrative, Chris Olave, again, 50 pass receptions in seven games. If Ohio State does what they did last year in a full season, which means you play in a conference championship game, you make it all the way yeah. to the national championship game. He plays 15 games. He catches over 100 passes when it's prorated. That doesn't happen at a place like Ohio State. I don't think it's ever happened. I think no. they're in the 90 catch range like David Boston might have that record. And uh, or maybe uh, da, 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 Terry Glenn or David Boston, I believe, has that record. But yeah. uh, because, my goodness, there's just too many options and they don't throw the ball every play. So it just doesn't happen at Ohio State. So Chris Olave, uh, he just strikes me and I'm no scout or coach, but more of the baller. You know, I, I guess I'm thinking back to the play he made against Michigan when he first hit the scene where he caught some passes down the stretch and really ass asserted himself into the lineup in 2018. But he made the play on special teams with a block punt. Like he's the kind of guy where th that he could be placed anywhere on the field. You know, you could put him at like safety and he's going to make plays. It just seems like he's just a gamer, regardless. Where Garrett Wilson looks like the prototypical NFL receiver, like in the uniform and the way he runs the routes and catches the football. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And, and you know, Chris Olave is still playing special teams, and I believe he probably will this year, even going into his senior year, which which has kind of been a standard. Terry McLaurin did it. Paris Campbell did it. There's been a number of guys who have embraced that role, even when they become factors on either offense or defense. Um, but the one thing I will say with with Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave with those stats, you know, last year obviously they focused so much on those guys. I think it was like 58% of the receptions went to those two and 69% of the receiving yard production. So um, I do think that that usage rate is going to come down this year. I think other guys, you know, whether it be um, some of these other receivers, a couple of tight ends we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, there will be more pass catchers getting more targets for Ohio State. But even if you bring that down some, you mentioned, you know, the potential of 15 games. I only looked at a 12 game regular season. You know, the numbers can still be ridiculous, um, especially if you you have a quarterback that continues to get better and better throughout the year for both of those guys, while other guys start to emerge as well. So, you know, it's it's a scary thought for Ohio State if, if even if, even if these guys get you know upwards of of 950 yards apiece in Garrett Wilson and and Chris Olave, you know that's that's a pretty ridiculous year to have two guys at that point. And we'll stay with the pass catchers, even though at Ohio State, they're not necessarily pass catchers much. They still make their way off to the NFL. And Jeremy Ruckert's the next one in line. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, he has a case and I think he'll try and make it this year to be the best tight end in the country. Um, as you mentioned, other schools tend to use the tight ends in the passing game more. I do think Ohio State will get Jeremy Ruckert more involved. You think back to the college football playoff last year. And, you know, obviously that was exposing some matchups, maybe things that, that Clemson, Alabama weren't expecting going to Jeremy Ruckert and Luke Farrell, who is one of those tight ends you mentioned that did get drafted despite not being a heavy pass catcher. But Jeremy Ruckert's coming off a 13 catch season, 151 yards, five touchdowns. And, you know, for a shortened season, that's that's pretty good numbers for an Ohio State tight end. I think he can be a major factor. This was a kid who was a wide receiver in high school always projected as a tight end at the next level um, with his frame and, and his build. But, you know, he had to work on more than anything, the blocking side of things when he got to Ohio State. So he's going to be the number one behind him is, is kind of a question mark. Cade Stover, who came to Ohio State as a linebacker, has now moved back to offense. He's playing tight end, did so last year, didn't play a ton. Um, he's probably the number two guy. And I think he's probably more in the mold of that blocking tight end. But I mentioned G. Scott Jr. earlier. He's a guy who can potentially come in and, and give another option as a receiver, you know, grew up as a receiver, still a big body guy. And behind them, they have, you know, a couple guys, young guys who who can probably just fill in for depth. But I think you, mostly you're going to see Jeremy Ruckert and uh, Cade Stover out there, Jeremy Ruckert being primarily the receiving tight end. And, you know, I, I also imagine you'll see less two tight end sets from Ohio State just because of the number of receivers that they've got. So Jeremy Ruckert may be the guy on the field the most this year. Um, and, and I think he can have, you know, a pretty good season. It's been a long time since you've had anyone get close to uh, 30 catches at a tight end position for Ohio State. I'm not sure that he'll get that many, but I think he can have, a, you know, get in the conversation for an All-American type, type year.